Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Why a preaching series on gratitude? How does that relate to the Christian life? Why might it be a useful thing for us to think about? And how does that fit with the Christian experience as recorded in Scripture. Our text for today comes from Paul of Tarsus. He's writing a letter to a church who they've been partnering with him in the mission of spreading the gospel for quite some time now. He writes a letter of encouragement, and the letter starts out by him stating the very obvious. He is in chains for the sake of the gospel. He's in Rome, in either prison or house arrest, but chained. And in the midst of this letter, if you've read Philippians, there's this uncommon theme, one that you would not expect that someone would have in prison. On every page, in every chapter, he talks about rejoicing. And at the beginning of this powerful section in chapter 4, he says it again, rejoice in the Lord always, I'll say it again, rejoice. And it's just about the same way he started chapter 3. And when we first hear those words, our initial thought might be, oh, Paul's having one of those mountaintop experiences. He's gone off onto a retreat. He's left all of his earthly responsibilities behind. And there he is just having this wonderful communion with God time. But in fact, it's not that at all. He's in chains. So these seven Sundays, starting today, we're going to dive in and take a look. What's there in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 20? A few verses from where we start today, Paul says this other thing that, that just might resonate with you, might even create a little bit of longing. He says, I've learned to be content. A few verses later, he says, I've learned the secret of being content. Would you like a little bit of that? If you've been around me for very long, uh, maybe on a planning team, this or that, you know that I can be a pretty complainy person. I tend to see what's wrong. I have eyes to see what needs to be fixed. That's how I'm wired. That's my gift to the world. Not everybody receives it that way. And about a year ago, a a member of our vestry, uh, he he invited me to an experience. It was called Q Talks, and they they meet in Grand Rapids, and it's this idea of, of how can God be at work renewing homes and communities through the Christian movement. And while watching these talks, these these. Great thinkers and leaders, they're given a whole nine minutes to take their life's work and deliver it. I thought preaching in 20 minutes was a challenge. And one of the folks who was speaking is a gal named Ann Voskamp. And she starts talking about the power of gratitude. I'm going to show you a couple of clips from that video that eventually grabbed hold of my head, my heart, my mind, and God is using to help change my attitude. 
but you might know that that change seems to come slowly to me, just as it might come slowly to you. But I need to tell you something before you listen to her speak with such enthusiasm about gratitude that her story starts in a very, very dark place. Her story starts by being locked up emotionally, being locked up spiritually, after the tragic, accidental death of her younger sister. And there is no more joy in her life and in her home. Until an equally tragic event happens in in the extended family, and that family member has a radically different approach to what had just transpired. And if you read in her book, you'll see that, that transformational place. But right now, I want to let her tell you about how science and Scripture lead to this powerful place of gratitude. So... The guy down at your corner store. He heard the Harvard academics in their white lab coats. Proved that the guy in probation and the kid cutting herself and the woman who just wants to throw in the towel and everybody else facing their own hard battles. If they wrote down just three things a day they were grateful for, they were less depressed, less suicidal, less apathetic than those who didn't practice lifestyle gratitude. That's what the guy thought. Well, take it or leave it. We all get to decide, doxology or dark. So it happened all around town, these guys picking up their pen and writing down three gifts a day. Because the research indicated that recording those blessings was cognitive training, a way of reorganizing your brain to focus on goodness, that it increases an individual's positive focus by 25%. What community, what family, what city does it need to increase their positive focus by 25% for free? So the women in the carpool line, they started counting gifts while they waited. And they could testify exactly what the scientific research proves. Those who practice lifestyle gratitude, who pick up a pen and just write down three things they're grateful for each day, have higher levels of alertness, enthusiasm, optimism. Attentiveness, energy, we're more motivated, likable, other-oriented, forgiving, generous, helpful, more likely to volunteer, and more likely to give back. So the whole town found out. Giving thanks and giving back our Siamese twins. They move as one. Hundreds of experiments across countless labs posit one deafening conclusion. Gratitude interventions result in radical, transformative improvements to personal and societal well-being. So that's what the community said. Take it or leave it. We all get to decide. Doxology or dark. And Chesterton said, thanks is the highest form of thought. To think is to thank. And if we aren't the people known for thanking God, maybe we aren't thinking enough of God. So it started a bit like a revolution around town. People in pews and in checkout queues, all looking for the good to be grateful for, and they witnessed it firsthand. Gratitude decreases selfishness, decreases greed, increases a focus on good, which increases levels of trust, which all together constitutes the necessary elements for societal flourishing. This past summer, I heard a, a, a father uh, in, a, in a preaching moment talk about uh, trying to instill the attitude of, of gratitude and thankfulness uh, in his family, in his children. Uh, maybe you've had that experience. Maybe, in fact, you're under someone's tutelage as, as a youngster or a teenager right now who's trying to help you be a person who gives thanks. And he told this story to illustrate how how much it just isn't a part of our natural makeup to be a thankful people. So it was many years ago, and he remembered it as if it were just recently. His daughter is that five-year-old, and and they're in the market. and, And the man who's at the 
at the fruit stand sees this cute little girl and takes a fresh orange from his fruit stand and he hands it to her. Dad, doing his coaching job off to the side, you know what he's going to say. He says, so what do you say to the nice man? And she thinks about it for a while. Then she thrusts it up to him and says, peel it! (laughs) If it wasn't so much like all of us, it wouldn't be so funny. Peel it. And God gives us all these great gifts and one more thing and I need you to do this. I remember reading in a devotional many years ago, it says, do not be an elephant. And I'm thinking, never wanted to be an elephant. I think I'm going to be okay here. And as I'm reading through the devotional, it talks about how the elephant uh, in the wild or in captivity has everything that that it needs, a full belly, uh, lots of grass, good exercise, right? And But at the end of the day, the elephant doesn't know who to thank. Don't be an elephant at the end of the day. So watching this video, all 10 minutes of it, reflecting on that a year ago, I'm not a quick study. It was four or five months later, reading Ann Voskamp's book, A Thousand Gifts, and hearing her story, starting to wonder if, if God might be wanting to do some work in me, that it might be a blessing in our marriage, that we would sit down at the beginning of a day and, and tell the three things that we were thankful for from the days before. So we've been on that journey for over 30 years weeks. And it's drawing us closer together as a couple. It's starting to rewire this set of eyes to be on the search, to be on the lookout. What's God up to? And what do I give to give that? What do I get to give thanks and praise for today? In the video, which I cut this part out, Anne talks about the difficulty of being in dark places. She she pictures it as if if there's hard things happening in your life, dark things happening in your life, and, 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 and picture yourself standing in a dark hole. And then with a shovel in your hand, trying to dig your way out. But the problem is, we tend to be thinking about the dark things, about the hard things, about the difficult things, and we're just moving around the dark stuff, and we're actually creating a darker space. And she goes on to talk about how, in fact, the darkness doesn't, doesn't remove dark. But it's only the light that scares and pushes away the darkness in our lives. And she invites us to be people who focus on the light. People who know the one who is the light of the world. And people who will radiate that in our homes and in our community. Gratitude amplifies goodness so that you can hear the grace of God. Gratitude amplifies the light of God so you can see the face of God in the midst of the dark. There was this woman who counted three gifts a day, who amplified the light, and she held up a photo of her baby for me to see because she canceled her appointment for an abortion, because she realized even the unexpected can be counted as a gift. There was a man who held up the point of his pen and whispered to me how he'd planned on plunging the point of a gun to the temple and ending it all. But the point of that pen counting gifts had amplified all this light that he hadn't seen before, and he was walking toward that light. 
And there are these one million people who have dared to live lifestyle gratitude, to amplify the goodness of his redemptive light, and they testify to change souls and cities. If you're grateful, you're not fearful. And if you're not fearful, you're not violent, you're peaceful. If you're grateful, you act out of the truth of abundance and not the myth of scarcity, and you become a reign of generosity that we all desperately need. Those one million people who kept thanks on their lips for their colleagues and their kids and their creator, they testified that gratitude stopped vicious cycles of dysfunction and created these virtuous cycles. Gratefulness amplifies goodness, which enhances wellness, which magnifies generousness, and multiplies more gratefulness. So ultimately, I'm asking you this morning to join this movement that now numbers more than a million folks who might take the dare to do that joyful, maybe hard thing, to start writing down three things a day for which you can give thanks. Science says, experience says, that it starts doing something with our minds and with our lives. You already know it. The people that you're attracted to, the people that you want to come next to, the people that you're wondering, how can I have more of this so that my life will be rich, are folks who live this way. And as those who carry the very light of Christ, it is in fact one of the grand ways that he positions us next to others who are hungering and longing for something more. And as he satisfies that something more in you, you become that unique carrier of something more for those around. So the question is, which comes first? Joy, for which we give thanks, or thankfulness that creates joy? They all thought when you are finally joyful, then you can finally be grateful. But the scripture and studies and their own gratitude interventions proved otherwise. Only when you finally give thanks will you finally get to be joyful. Being joyful isn't what makes you grateful. Being grateful is what makes you joyful. Gratitude in our circumstances is essential to our wholeness as any change in our circumstances. And yeah, no, <laughs> you may be thinking the dark you're facing in your community, your family, your city, your life is too dark. But Jesus, when he was staring right into the very face of evil, what does he do? Out of a universe of supernatural options, what does Jesus decide? And on the night he was betrayed, Jesus broke bread, lifted it, and gave thanks. If Jesus can give thanks in that you can give thanks in anything. If Jesus chooses gratitude as elemental in destroying evil, do you have a better weapon against the dark? If out of a cosmos of choices, Jesus chose to give thanks in the face of evil, then maybe our giving thanks is how we advance the good. Perhaps we've come into worship like an elephant, not knowing who to give thanks to or not being in a habit of giving thanks. Maybe we've come like the five-year-old little girl and our response to his gifts is one more demand, peel it. But as we come today into the presence of the living God, whether we're on the midst of a mountaintop or in life's greatest valley, one comes to you today through bread and wine, the very body and blood of Christ, known as the Eucharist, as the thanksgiving meal, the one who comes to be the greatest light amplifier the world has ever known, is the one who's stood in darkness, in a darkness deeper than any darkness you would ever know or need to know, and gone all the way 
to death and hell so that he can bring you out of that pit by his strength, by his mercy, by his love. So today we will come because he's come to give us himself so that we might have, again, another reason to give thanks that Christ has come to come to be in us and with us, to make us whole, his forgiven people renewed. Amen? Amen. And now may the peace that passes understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen.